So how does the eye turn the light that enters into it into a sensation of color? Different light sources or illuminants have different compositions of wavelengths, and mostly if that mixed up soup of photons is somewhat even across the board, a balance of different wavelength photons, we've evolved to perceive that as white light. And if it's a little imbalanced, our eyes can adjust. But what if it's not balanced at all? Our eyes also evolved what we think of as color vision, but what you could also describe as wavelength imbalance detection. I'm going to grab some graph paper to help us visualize how this works, and I highly encourage you to grab some graph paper too and do this exercise as well. Let's fill a 7x7 seven seven grid with letters A through L randomly. I'm just going to go through in alphabetical order, but jump around in terms of where I'm putting the letters. That means I'll go through A through L four times and uh, have one extra. So each letter represents a photon. Let's say the closer to A, the more energy the photon has and thus the shorter wavelength. A and B photons are high energy ultraviolet photons, which are invisible, so I'm blacking them out. The closer it is to L, the less energy the photon has, and so K and L are infrared photons, which are also invisible to us, so let's black those out. My square of graph paper represents the light beaming out of a light source with equal power across the spectrum. It's got balance, or the same amount of photons represented at every wavelength. That means we won't perceive that light as having any particular color. Why? Remember, because you can describe color as wavelength imbalance detection, and this light source is completely balanced. But if my light source hits a yellow object, like this block, the shortest wavelengths are going to get absorbed, and all the other wavelengths are going to bounce off, and some will reach our eye. We detect that imbalance, that lack of short wavelengths. Okay, to simulate this absorption of short wavelength photons, I'm going to punch out all the highest energy ones. The ones, the yellow blocks absorbing, those are the squares with letters A, B, C, D, and a couple of the E squares for good measure. Now, if we count up how many squares we have left with each letter, we can make a bar chart to display that count. This graph is a basic version of a spectral reflectance graph, and it shows how many photons of each wavelength are reflected to our eye from the yellow block. So this is important. This is the information that's coming to our eyes, but our eyes don't detect these graphs. We don't have a full range of detectors to get all these photon counts. Our eyes have only three input channels for daylight vision, not eight or more, like this bar chart suggests. So how does our eye compress all of this information into three channels? We have three types of sensors for daylight vision, cone cells called long, medium, and short. Each gathers a different range of photon wavelengths, and those ranges overlap. Now let's study this graph, which is a simplified version of how each cone type responds to photons across the spectrum. Let's imagine each of our three sensors has three possible responses at each wavelength, zero, half, and full sensitivity. The sensor missed that wavelength, half saw it, or totally saw it. So for example, at wavelength E, our long cone has zero sensitivity, our medium cone has half sensitivity, and our short cone has full sensitivity. Make sense? Let's look at another example. At wavelength h, our L cone has full sensitivity, our M cone has half sensitivity, and our S cone has zero sensitivity. Light with a wavelength of k is invisible to us. Why? Because L is at zero, M is at zero, and S is at zero. All three of our sensors aren't responding, therefore we can't see that light. Here's the reflectance spectrum of our yellow block again. Remember the block absorbed the shorter wavelengths and reflected these longer wavelengths to our eye. But our eye compresses that information through these sensors with their overlapping sensitivities. So we'll multiply the number of photons at each wavelength by the sensitivity factor of each cone at each wavelength and then sum up those numbers.
Okay, so if we add these numbers together, we get the total stimulation for the S cone. If we add these numbers together, we get the total stimulation for the M cone. And if we add these numbers together, we get the total stimulation for the L cone. This combination of three numbers is what our brain happens to interpret as the color yellow. You know, at least in this simplified version of how this works. I want to make a point here. Each sensor doesn't know the difference between the wavelengths it's detecting. It only knows how much it's being stimulated overall by the range it's sensitive to. This is why it's not sensible to label a certain wavelength of light as having a color. Wavelengths don't have color. Imbalances of wavelengths cause the sensation of color. And if you understand that, it allows you to understand how color mixing works.